Welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us today for our webinar, Ask Me Anything About MQTT Take Two, which is the second edition of our AMA webinar and a joint session with Industry 4.0.tv. Uh, I am super excited to introduce you all to our panelists for today. Dominic Obermeyer, CTO and co-founder at HiveMQ. Uh, Florian Rashpichler, Head of Support at HiveMQ, and Kutsai Manditaritsa, Technology Communicator and Founder of uh, Industry 4.0 TV, who will be joining us uh, in a while. Uh, joined by Dominic, Florian, and Kutsai uh, is Ian Skerritt, Head of Marketing at HiveMQ, who will be moderating the Q&A. Uh, before we get started, I would like to share a couple of uh, housekeeping pointers for the session. Uh, first and foremost, we are recording this session and the recording will be shared in a follow-up email with you all. Uh, initially, all participants will be on mute. Ian will unmute your mic as and when needed. I also request you all to use the Q&A box from the control panel to ask your questions and refrain from asking questions in the chat box. And as we progress through the session, there will be two polls running. Request you all to actively participate and provide feedback. Uh, and lastly, if there are any unanswered questions during the session, we will answer them on the HiveMQ community forum and share the link to the answers over the email uh, at a later point of time. Uh, now, without further ado, we will continue the session. I will hand it over to Ian. Thank you very much, Jayashree, and, and welcome, everyone. Um, this is, a, kind of, as Jayashree said, this is the second time we've done this. Um, to, to get going, we, we'd like to kind of just get a sense of kind of where people are in their MQT journey. Um, so could we uh, spend kind of, kind of maybe 30 to, to 60 seconds, um, if you could would mind completing these poll questions, um, just and will help us kind of understand kind of what, what level of experience we have here um, and kind of help Dominic and Florian kind of judge the, the, how to craft their responses. Um, and hopefully we might make a better better webinar. Um, so I'll give people another kind of 15, 15 seconds to, to finish this. Um, and then we'll we'll kind of proceed here. Um, Okay, so it looks like around 60% are beginners, uh, about 40%, 37% are intermediate and 1% is an expert. So there's one person who's an expert. So I hope you, but thank you for joining. We, you should probably be helping us answer some questions here. Um, in terms of the deployment, um, about 40% are currently deploying, um, kind of 16% kind of underway uh, and the remaining have plans plans for for deployment so um so i very much appreciate uh, the, the feedback here um and so let's let's get started so so just as a reminder um please ask your questions in the q a um and what we'll, we'll try and do is is um uh, ask when you when we ask your questions we'll try and unmute your mic and so you can do follow-ups for this. But we had some, some questions uh, initially from, from, kind of from people who submitted in, in advance. Um, so we're gonna start with them. And the first question, so security is always a question that we have around MQTT and, and, and IRT. So it's, it's always a, a big big topic. So let's, let's start there. And um, uh, actually Florian, I'll start with you, um, if that's okay. What, so what are some good practices for securing M MQTT? Thanks, Ian. Um, that's obviously a, a, a very important, very good question, not only in IoT, but generally in the IT space. So let's think about security. And when, when it comes to security in IoT, specifically using the MPP protocol, it is my opinion that we have three most important uh, pillars here that need to be adhered by. And those are encryption, authentication, and authorization. And I will go through the three of them really quickly and explain why you need it and how you can implement it. So encryption in the first place is just to make sure if your communication channel somehow is compromised and someone can, can sniff your packets um, with encryption, you ensure that they, they cannot actually gain the contents unencrypted of the packets. And typically uh, as MQTT is an application layer protocol based on the TCP IP, 
um, stack, you would use what is called a TLS connection um, for your connectivity as the encryption layer. On top of encryption, you also want authentication. So you want to make sure that everybody participating in the communication is who they say they are. And some of the, some of the techniques uh, used for authentication can be um, a username password um, communication, the MQTT connect packet specifically allows for that. Some more modern technologies will be, for example, uh, so-called um, chase and web tokens, JWTs. So OAuth 2.0 would here also be a keyword uh, that can also be used for authentication or even with MQTT5 um, enhanced authentication mechanism with a challenge response type uh, authentication like SASL can also be used. And then thirdly, and very importantly, is authorization. So um, once you identified who you are, it's also very important to know what you're allowed to do. So, and in, in, in the context of MQTT, um, authorization refers to topic access. So you don't want anybody connecting to your broker to be able to uh, subscribe to all topics, to publish to all topics. So what you do here is you apply so-called uh, topic permissions. So as an example, for example, uh, you could have um, a backend application that's merely there to subscribe and collect the pub published messages and then visualize them or store them to a database. So this backend application has no need for ever publishing any messages. So you would only allow that application to subscribe. So. Okay, so perfect. And so it's kind of, more detailed follow-up this is um from half to say and half so i'm going to allow you to talk after florian kind of finishes this response to your second question um is is the use of self-signed certificates for client authentication a bad practice if so what is the right way to do that um, i would not necessarily say that it's a it's a bad practice um it's 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 certainly not uncommon and, and um, it, it can be done Ideally, um, I would I would recommend doing like a, a combination um, where first firstly you use the certificate itself, so where the the private key of the certificate basically is used for the authentication. But then on top of that, you can also add a username password um, authentication. Or if you, for example, look at something like the enterprise security extension for HiveMQ that is actually cap capable of looking inside of the certificate, grabbing a certain claim of the certificate, such as the um, sub subject common name, and then use that subject common name, for example, as an authentication key. So are client uh, self-centered certificates a bad practice? No, but you can, for best practices, I would add an additional authentication mechanism. So Hafsa, did, did that answer your question or do you, do you want to ask a follow-up? Uh, yes, uh, that did uh, answer my question. Um, but in the, in the same time, I have uh, another question that is related to the same subject, if I may. Sure. Yeah. Sure, sure. So um, supposedly uh, we have a certificate uh, that is self-signed and uh, we want to uh, be sure that that certificate will be only used uh, by a certain machine. Um, for example, um, our client, in case uh, uh, he uh, shared that certificate um, in uh, another machine, uh, we can detect that and uh, know that it's, it's used uh, by uh, another desktop. Is that possible? Is there a way uh, to um, to know uh, or to bind that certificate to a certain uh, hardware. Uh, so yeah, here here you can you can really utilize the MQTT protocol for this, and like I just described, basically the, the mechanism of using one of the claims as a part of your authentication flow. What we see here typically is that some kind of unique identifier for the machine, such as a serial number or maybe even a MAC address if it's a computer, whatever um, unique identifier you have, you can use that as your, as your common name 
and then make sure that this also needs to be used as the MQTT client ID, and then basically verify that this unique identifier also is the MQTT client ID, and then this way you have an additional layer of security um, that the machine authenticate actually is who they say they are. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Perfect. Thanks for your question. Okay, um, so we're going to move on to kind of just a, a question for, for, for Dominic. Um, how many concurrent TCP connections is supported by a single broker installed on a single server? And is, is there a limitation by, by the operating system? Oh, it's a very good question. Um, because um, as especially beginners are sometimes not aware of when, when it comes to MQDT, the TCP connection um, is a standing TCP connection because usually you want your devices to co be connected all the time. So the thing is, <clears throat> let's say if you start with 10 devices and you scale up to a million devices or, or even more, um, then like all of these need to be handled by the operating system. So usually uh, you, you want to deploy your MQDT brokers on Linux machines. Why? Because nowadays Linux machines really support a lot of concurrent connections on the TCP layer. So um, what we recommend here at HiveMQ, so because also, by the way, what you also have is if you would have a single broker, like um, you see this with a lot of open source brokers, for example, um, if you only have a single broker and you have, let's say, a million devices connected to that, it might be technically possible. Going beyond 1 million MQDT connections on a single broker node is, let's say, unorthodox. You usually don't want to do that because if let's say that machine breaks for some reason, then all of the million devices will be disconnected and they need to reconnect and so on. So this, this is basically the blast radius, how we call it, it's pretty large there. So what you want to do is basically you want to pack a lot of MQT connections on one server, but you also want to go distributed across multiple servers. So brokers like HiveMQ, for example, they allow this kind of clustering and we recommend to have Let's say between 100K and yeah, 700K, so sweet spot is usually between 250 and 500K um, devices per node. So this is what you usually want. You can pick up to one million, up to one million TCP connections. But the thing is, just from a resource consumption perspective, one million MQT connections with a standard Linux kernel configuration, you will have let's say this 30 gigabyte of RAM just for the TCP connection on a single machine. So um, our experience from a, let's say, um, most bang for the buck is, is really um, distributed across multiple machines and have 250 to 500 and go above if you, if you can, if you know what you're doing. Um, but this works out of the box. So no current tuning needed. If you're very experimental, you can go beyond, but this is usually um, requires TCP tuning. So, go for 250 to 500K, um, but technically you can go much further with a lot of drawbacks. Okay, great. And, and Dominic, I'm gonna keep you up um, on this one. So this is a question about HiveMQ Cloud. It's from Bob Jones, this is a live question. Mm -hmm. um, within Hive, um, he's using the free HiveMQ Cloud. Um, mm -hmm. The cluster detail capa capacity indicates MQT client sessions, um, 61 over 100. Please explain what the, num the numbers means. What happens when it reaches 100 over 100? Is there a way I can clear and reset the number and do the sessions auto reset monthly? Mm. Yeah, good, good question. So thank you for that. So um, to give context for people who are not aware of what this question is about, um, here at HiveQ, we have a HiveQ Cloud with a free offering. This means there's a no strings attached um, free plan, which allows you to connect up to 100 devices um, and basically use it for free. So you don't need a credit card, nothing. Um, the thing is, it's limited to 100 devices. And technically we're talking about sessions here. So a, a MQTT session, so, so we need to talk about that because what is an MQTT session? First of all, if you have a, let's say a, a device which connects and stays connected, this is a session. But MQTT allows you also for this neat feature called um, huge messages and so on, where basically if your device goes offline, the broker will basically save all the messages the device while it was offline didn't receive and sends it out as soon as the device is online again. So you can make sure your application or your device will never uh, lose any message. So this is what, why it's what we call session. So if the broker remembers the MQTT client, 
um, while it's offline, then you have this session. So Hive Eco Cloud, um, in contrast to a lot of other, uh, let's say, offerings, allows for that. And but the thing is, like, what is really bad is if you have a device which never comes up again. So what's happening is here, Hive Cloud remembers how much sessions you have because it will save messages for you if you if you tell it. Um, but it's limited to 100. So it will auto clear after some time. So um, this is not unlimited in the free plan. So you, you make sure you your device is reconnected after a certain time, but you can also basically reset that by using the uh, MQTT clean session flag with your MQTT connection. So you can reset that. Um, if you, let's say, want to go above 100 devices, there's also the pay per use plan we have. And the pay per use plan allows you basically for, for um, 10 cents or so per device to, uh, to connect up to 1,000 devices. So which is still pretty affordable, but for larger deployments. So um, long story short, yes, a session is, a, is, is either a connected clients or the sessions you, you tell you want to create it when connecting the device. And you can set this in your MQTT client application you're using if you want to have a clean session or a, what we call persistent session. And this is counted. So hope this helps. So, so, so Bob, um, Bob Jones, if, if you are able to unmute, uh, unmute your mic, if you want to follow up a question, or if, does that answer your question? Okay, so I don't think he's 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 responding. So, so we'll we'll move on um, to 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 the next question. Um, th this is um, kind of a follow up for for the capacity question, the initial capacity question. Um, <clears throat> so regarding the capacity handling, more messages with less payload or less messages with more payload would be what would be the best in the sense of the performance? <clears throat> Dominic, do you want to handle that maybe? Yeah, sure. So um, like all good answers in, in IT, the answers, it depends. But let me tell you what I mean with that. So it, dep it really depends on the, on the use case. So, um, and what you want to achieve. So MQTT is extremely lightweight. This means it adds only a very small, tiny amount of protocol on top of TCP IP. The thing is, if you send a lot of small devices, a lot of small messages all the time, um, then you basically, you could save some bandwidth, right? Um, uh, but, um, uh, how, how is it? So you could, you could save some bandwidth. Um, on the other hand, if you send these large messages all the time, um, you don't get this kind of real-time features um, of MQT where you have, let's say, data very needed. And this is usually depends on how you make your topic structure. So what we really recommend is to have um, basically less than, let's say, one kilobyte or less than one megabyte at least of messages. So we don't think it's the best idea to put in like a 10 megabyte message and send it. And, there, and why? is because the MQT protocol does not support resumption. So if you're having, let's say, a mobile device, you're driving around and you lose connectivity after, let's say, transmission of a few megabytes, you will need to restart that. So we wouldn't have recommended in that setting. If we have, for example, an industry 4.0 use case, um, it can absolutely be possible to have larger messages, but less frequent. Um, what is a very bad idea is to have very large messages, messages and high frequent messages because you will overwhelm your MQT clients. So when you talk about performance, it's usually the backend systems and the MQT clients that are the bottleneck, not the broker, at least not in the case we see with our customers. So it depends. And so I think, I think if, if let's talk about the use case, if you have a mobile use case, use, let's say, not as large messages. If you have a, a stationary use case, use larger messages um, and always be aware how much, as, so what is really the frequency you need? Um, because on the other extreme, you really don't want to have, a, let's say, 10 or even 100 messages per second uh, per device. This is also not what you want. So this is really a trade-off. Um, if I had more, more details about the use case, I could probably give a, a better recommendations. So I ran uh, Toro Sulu. Do you want to kind of do a follow-up question to, to describe your use case, or is, was that sufficient? Uh, yeah, maybe. So can you hear me? Yes, yes, oh, you can. Quick. 
Oh, okay, thank you. So um, we're just like trying to send the um, messages with the more playloads and then the let's um, let's close lo with the playloads with the publishing like per topic and to see if the broker can handle it. But mm -hmm. now, um, as uh, just mentioned that it's not with the broker, but it's the MQTT on well, it's more side of the MQTT then. Yeah, it's usually more, it, it also depends a bit on the broker, of course. So, so this is why you really need to test it. If you're using, for example, there are some open source brokers where you might get into problems, um, depending on, again, what you're using. But usually, um, if you, you need to look at the consuming applications um, and, and how, what capacity they have. Because just imagine if you have a lot of large messages and you just send it to one device, um, it could go out of memory. Um, the broker itself can sufficiently, let's say, at least in the case of HiveQ, it can protect itself against if you really want to overload that, their broker will protect itself by basically slowing things down. Um, but not all brokers do that. So, so be aware here. So what we really recommend is here also do capacity planning. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty sure we'll talk about capacity planning also today to give a bit more insight. But in a nutshell, there are tools out there where you can do that, either let's say traditional old school tools, which doesn't allow you to really simulate MQT like JMeter or other tools, or tools like HiveMQ Swarm, which allow you to really model your use case and then run it against the actual broker you wanna test. And you can also test your, let's say MQTT applications um, who wanna consume messages. So this is what we recommend here. But let's say the quick answer is again, mm -hmm. It, it depends, don't go into the extremes. Um, as always, usually the middle ground is something you wanna do, but, but please stay below one megabyte or at least 10 megabyte for a single MQT message. Oh, okay. Well, okay. thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank, thank you, you for your question. Your question. So, okay, we're gonna go on and, and we're gonna go back to a kind of a security follow-up. Um, so so Florian, maybe you, you could help with this one. What, what happens when there are, there is two clients same client ID where they send with where they send by one. What happens when there is two of the same client ID where they send one by one? So yeah, let me add some uh, assumption about the context here. I, yeah. I'm I'm interpreting this as what happens if I have two clients that are share, sharing the same client ID and that are trying to connect to the broker. This is a good question, especially in the in the context of what I previously said about um, matching potentially the client ID versus uh, contents of a, of a um, self-sent certificate. And uh, the quick answer here is that um, this particular uh, situation is covered by the MQTT protocol. Um, it, there is something that is called the client takeover mechanism. And what would happen in this case is that the broker would always make sure if a new client with an existing connected client ID connects to the broker, the broker must disconnect the existing client session. Um, why is that? Well, that is because um, the typical use case for a situation where a client ID that is already existing on the broker connects again to the broker would be that ex an existing connection between a client and a broker um, has failed in a have open the TCP connection kind of way and the client has acknowledged that it is no longer connected to the broker whereas the broker did not yet um, acknowledge that the client has left. So th this is what this is. So, so this is basically for the cleanup of um, that have open connections. Of course, if you do in your application run into a situation where you actually use two separate clients sharing a client ID, this is an anti-pattern and both of them, there will be an, an indefinite disconnect uh, uh, chain happening between the two of them un until you decide to not have to have one of them not uh, reconnect or change the client ID. Um, so th this question came from Pran Pranav. Um, do you want to ask a follow up? Did, did that answer your question? You have to unmute yourself if you do. Okay. Oh yes, yes, yes. It is. Uh, uh, it answered my question. Okay. Perfect. Well, thank you for your question. Thank you. Um, thank you. So, so another um, uh, question um, was kind of what will be the securest way to use credentials on a client side, 
example, uh, JavaScript on WebSockets. Um, so, I mean, the securest way, the most secure way. Um, so yeah, as as as, uh, as I was trying to point out in uh, in, my, the, in the previous sh short session here is that um, using encryption is basically the base pillar on which you uh, which you build your security of the connection. So you would want want to use in this case secure web sockets, right? So an, a, a web socket over MQTT connection that is also TLS encrypted. And this way, um, you would you would prevent anybody from reading the credentials inside uh, inside the packet. And then, um, yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, so let's let's go on. And actually, we're kind of getting follow up questions on the high availability of, of brokers and number connections for brokers. So, so um, Dominic, maybe you can help here. Um, so, and I'm going to kind of combine two questions. So, for high availability, does MQ protocol support a redundant broker system? But also adding into this, what's the limit of the number of connections on a broker? Depends on PC specs or a version of MQTT. So can we can combine the, those two together, Dominic? Uh, yeah, let me, let me just start with the last one and, and go into the first one again. So actually the limit, there are two limits, the broker implementation as well as really the operating system limits on a single machine. So, um, when it comes, I, I can only speak here for HiveMQ. We also know, of course, the other broker limitations, but but this is really something um, that uh, I think really depends on also the, the context here. But the um, let's say on a single HiveMQ node, the limit is really one million. We support the Linux operating system would support more, but this is really something we support one million per node, and we support ten million connections per cluster. So the maximum cluster size in HiveMQ is, is 10 million um, in a single cluster. There are patterns how, let's say, to increase that. So we have customers who have much more uh, but uh, connections connected to their systems, but they basically use a, a principle called sharding. They have multiple um, clusters, basically. And usually you also want, at that scale, you, you want to have this in multiple ge geographic regions. So this is one thing. Um, uh, so, but this is really, this is, this is HiveQ specific. Um, some people claim for their products, other things like, like ridiculous numbers, uh, you can test it themselves, you can test all it yourself, uh, but usually you will hit limits much, much, much more below. Um, so here, but we support up to 10 million in the cluster. So, and the first question is basically, um, uh, basically, uh, from a let's say, what is a cluster? So, how can you even do high availability? And I think this is something I want to elaborate on because the MQTT protocol is really simple. The MQTT protocol makes it incredibly simple for MQTT client applications. Um, but how brokers need to be implemented is something uh, basically left to, to the to the broker vendor. And the thing about MQTT is, is as it is designed by the specification. There's a single point of failure because all the devices are expected to be connected to one broker. The thing is, if that one broker breaks because the machine is, is broken or something like that, or in the cloud, all of the devices will be disconnected and hence cannot send any messages and receive messages. So they're offline. So the question is, how do, how do you get high availability? So how can you make sure that uh, basically if one system fails, nothing happens? Um, then could, the MQT specification doesn't really talk about that because this is really up to the broker vendor. So how we do that is we were basically the first broker on the market who solved that problem, um, which is we introduced clustering back then, which means you have multiple machines which form one logical broker. So from a device perspective, they don't care to what broker they're connected. It looks like it's one broker. The benefit is if you're on Kubernetes, if you're on the cloud or somewhere else, and a single machine fails, no problem because um, the client can reconnect to the other brokers. They can resume their session, continue message flow as if nothing happened. And this is clustering. Um, there are other mechanisms which really don't really work. Uh, let's say in a professional setting, at least things like bridging, you will see that. You can make sure redundant message flow. But what you really want to do is from a, you really don't want to card code any 
logic into your devices where the brokers are and so on. Because what you really want is this elastically scaling broker infrastructure, which means you need a cluster. Um, and this is something what actually HiveMQ, what we provide. Because the broker itself, like you have a community edition also out there, uh, which is open source, you can use. It doesn't have high availability, but for professional settings, you almost always want to use a technology like the HiveMQ cluster technology, um, which allows it to be redundant. So um, yeah, hope, hope that helps because you really need to avoid the single point of failure with MQDT. Otherwise, especially for mission critical deployments, otherwise you will get into huge problems when your single broker will fail. So use cluster. Great. Th thanks, Dominic. Um, actually, I'd like to welcome uh, Kutsai, our, our uh, thir third panelist. Um, so Kutsai, welcome. And um, I, I know you had a bit of, bit of power problems. So um, so, but but thank you for, for joining us. Um, and I have a, a question for you, Kutsai, here. Um, what are the, so Kutsai uh, runs the Industry 4.0 TV channel, the really popular YouTube channel that, that talks about using um, technology for Industry 4.0 uh, use cases. So we have a question that's ideal for you. So what are the top two MQD use cases in Industry 4.0 that you have ever seen? Could you, could you uh, help us with that, Kutsai? You're on mute, Kutsai. Okay, uh, thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Ian, for the um, uh, introduction there and uh, apologies for the uh, late uh, appearance. Okay, uh, yeah, so, well, talking about the, the, the use cases of MQTT, uh, an example that I could give is, uh, uh, for example, one that I've personally uh, worked on is uh, on a logistic uh, management system. Uh, whereby we've got some uh, remote uh, 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 plants where there is, there is, uh, there is some oxygen uh, gas tanks, which could be uh, oxygen, nitrogen. So now uh, it's a situation whereby the, 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 the provider of these services now needs to be able to, to manage the, the, the logistics to know uh, which tank uh, needs to be uh, refilled uh, at any given time. So obviously, instead of uh, getting that information and uh, 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 looking at it from uh, um, using your traditional method where you need to call the client to find out what is the level of the tank. You want to have a situation whereby uh, that information can be pushed straight from the source to notify uh, the, the client that there's uh, so much uh, uh, um, amount of, of, uh, of, of oxygen or, or nitrogen gas at that tank. Uh, and then so that information is pushed from the, uh, from the clients to a centralized broker and then the head office has got a client which subscribed to all of that information and is able to visualize all of that information uh, in real time. So also the situations whereby there is, um, there is some uh, valve that are, are controlling those tanks. So you want to have a situation whereby you are, you are able to, uh, to, to be notified whenever there is a pest in the, in the pipes or there is some malfunctioning of the valve. So that information you want it to be sent out immediately uh, 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 to, to, to that centralized backend. Now, obviously, you don't want to have a situation whereby you are using a polling mechanism where you're always checking uh, the level of the tanks, where you're always checking to see the status or the health of the equipment there. You want a situation that notifies you whenever that uh, happens so that you don't throttle the bandwidth, you don't consume a lot of data. So this is where MQTT is ideal because all of that information gets pushed uh, from, the, uh, from the client. You don't need to, to, um, to poll it all the time. So you consume a lot. Of, you you conserve a lot of bandwidth in in, in such a situation. So that's one uh, 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 use case of uh, uh, an, an MQTT uh, system. And then also you'd have a, 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 a SCADA system where generally it's a it's a it's a process automation and, and and control system, right? So where you really want to to be able to uh, uh, integrate different uh, systems. So you you could be integrating your historian. Uh, with your SCADA system and also a PLC. Now, you, you don't want a situation whereby, because traditionally what you'd have to do in such a situation is that you'd have to actually write some, some code or you've got to write a lot of code to actually connect a new system. So uh, a, a use case for MQT Spark Plug in such a situation is where you are able to use the auto discovery feature where you actually plug and play a system into that uh, 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 network of, of devices with no software programming at all, just configuring, putting your broker URL address, 
and then or, or automatically that information shows up in your in your SCADA infra in interface, and then you're able to communicate with that uh, 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 equipment. So yeah, basically those are the two uh, uh, use cases that I could uh, come up with at the moment. So this this question came from Stefan. Um, did that answer your question, Stefan? Yeah, thank you. That was uh, very helpful examples. So which use case are you considering for industry 4.0? I'm uh, dealing more with use cases where we're not going to try to reach the SCADA, but the rest of the world, the rest of the TCP IP world, uh, going uh, more vertical in the integration of machines. Okay. Okay. Good. Well, good luck with that. Um, so um, we're going to move on. Um, there's a, a, a couple of very specific questions. So we'll, we'll try this um, uh, out to see how, how we do here. So um, I, this is from... Ninad uh, Shah, uh, I'm using MQT for our home automation system. We have BLE de devices connected to our local controller via BLE, and the controller is running on a, a local broker. The mobile phones are connected to this controller by our local broker to send and receive MQT messages. The controller is forwarding local notifications to the cloud, so whoever is connected to the cloud can also send and receive messages. Is this correct architecture, or are we not following standard practice? Um, Dominic or, or Florian, do you want to take that? Um, yeah, so, so it's, a, it's a very specific question. So I, I do hope I, I got that all in my head together. So um, first of all, let me start with the cloud part. So basically that you have this kind of, of let's say relaying to and from the cloud. Uh, this is something that I think makes a lot of sense. And um, especially, well, please make sure in this case that let's say the, I think it was a Raspberry Pi if I understood it correctly. Um, so home, home automation system. Oh, so oh yes, yeah. so home automation right. system yeah. is basically acting as an MQTT client to the outside. So you do not, please do not export, let's or expose the broker on your home automation system to the outside. This is super critical, really. Um, please make sure that this broker acts as a MQTT client. How is this? How can this be done? Basically, this needs to to be a, a so-called bridge, where basically, as let's say an outgoing bridge this device connects into a broker in the cloud. For example, um, either an MQTT compliant um, broker like HiveMQ um, or Mosquito or something like that. Or um, if you must, you can also connect to non-compliant MQTT brokers, which do not support the specification like AWS and, and Azure IoT, where you have a very proprietary version of MQTT, but you could even connect there if you, if you need to. Um, but please stick to open standards if you can. Um, and then, because then you don't have an attack vector to the outside, um, to your system. So please make sure it acts as a client. So number one, the second part is MQT over Bluetooth low energy, if I understood that correctly. Um, this is an interesting one because uh, Bluetooth low energy has a lot of awesome properties, um, but also, um, um, let's say, depending on what you want to do, this you might get into troubles with TCP IP over Bluetooth low energy. Um, um, yeah, so this is also something basically where, um, the, let's say the smaller sister of MQTT, which is MQTT SN, MQTT for sensor networks, really might be um, something worthwhile looking at. Uh, currently, also we, we at HiveMQ here, and I'm personally I'm helping with the standardization of MQTT for sensor network, networks. It is currently at the OASIS technical committee, but it won't be released, let's say, publicly probably until next year. Um, but there is software out there which you can already use, but this is pretty early on. This is something, again, MQTT or Bluetooth low energy um, is something that might work, but you probably will get bad experiences with having a MQTT SM here. So these are the two things I, I would say. Otherwise, I really would need to look at an architecture diagram to help here. But for now, um, it sounds uh, like a good approach. Did, I, did, did that answer your question or did you have a quick follow-up? Uh, yeah, partly it's answered. Uh, one part is remaining actually. Uh, people who are connected to cloud, we have one broker running on the cloud also. From there, we are forwarding our uh, MQTT messages to a client running on that controller. And basically it's a pi. Mm -hmm. That forwards to local controller, and from that it, it forwards to the um, mobile connected to local controller. Ah, okay, yeah, this this, this sounds good because if, if this is already a client and you don't expose the broker to the outside, this is a very critical piece. So this 
like I, I, of course for detailed let's say maybe we would need to look at that but from a first what i've heard is um it sounds like a good approach okay great thank you th thank, thank you. you for your question so um right so, so we're, we're going to move on um so i think there, there's i'm just going to try and group up a, a couple of these um because they're, they're dealing with clustering um so so Dominic, so kind of uh Tarun was asking how many brokers can be clustered, um, yeah. and uh, someone else was asking, uh, kind of how can we implement distributed server for handling and multiple MQT clients to prevent blackout if we depend on a single server? So, yeah, clustering. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. so, we, so, so for the second part of the question, absolutely use clustering. MQT clustering is really the way to go. Um, so use a broker that is clustered. So, so basically, if you're using one broker for some reason because of a blackout of a machine or so you always have other brokers like one or multiple um so and, and what is the limit so how many brokers can you cluster i mean this really depends so i can only speak for having you here there are not many let's say production grade cluster solutions out there we we know of that that work um but having you is one of them that that really works and and so we use let's say 40 nodes or so, um, but also like 20 to 40 nodes is usually what you want to do to connect 10 million devices. Um, you can go up, you can also go down. Um, again, it, it depends a bit on what kind of machines you're running. If you're running in the cloud, if you're running on bare metal. So there are some, let's say it, depend, it depends a bit here again, but uh, we, we've seen custom deployments which use, um, let's say for, for five million connections, just let's say five to six machines, uh, but also some who really use, let's say, a 25 plus cluster um, for some of the machines, uh, for, for some clusters. It, it really depends. Um, but let's rule of thumb stay below 40, um, and then you're good to go. But I, I would say, let's say, what is the minimum if there's a follow up question for high availability, especially in the cloud? Um, we would recommend to start with three nodes. And actually, this is what our what we also recommend to all our customers. Usually our customers start with three nodes, um, even for smaller deployments. So because in this case, you can even tolerate two node failures for mission critical systems, this is really something you want. So Tarun, did that answer your question about how, how many brokers can be clustered? Yeah, so so uh, like we can divide them geographically, or like they need, they need to be at the same single location. So good good question. Usually, what is done, um, you want to have it um, if you can in separate let's say data centers or so. So you have this kind of uh, if you, because if you run it on the same machine, like if you virtualize it and run it on the same machine, like you wouldn't gain anything, right? So let's say let's talk about the cloud, for example. What we see as a very good pattern is stay in the same region and then have, uh, let's say, using multiple availability zones. If you're using AWS, for example, same is true for Azure, same is true for Google Cloud, and on, of course, other providers, because usually they have this kind of separation already in there. But um, what we recommend is to have a low latency between the, the broker nodes. Why? Because otherwise, the, let's say, the, the uh, customer experience could suffer because of increased latencies. So if you would say have, let's say one broker in, uh, let's say in Singapore, the other broker in New York, um, then you, you, cannot, you cannot really um, beat the speed of light, right? So you will get hundreds of milliseconds um, in addition to most messages you're sending and you really wanna avoid it. So um, if you wanna look at, let's say, cluster, basically clustering multiple clusters, this is something that nobody on the market can do currently. But I would recommend to stay tuned, uh, go to the Hyphen Q, let's say, new, uh, uh, newsletter list. So, um, because this is also something uh, that is, I believe, important for the future. Tarun, um, hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, sure, sure. Thanks. Okay, thank you for your question. So, um, so we're, we've got a very specific question around uh, keep alive. So, so maybe Florian, you, you could help us with, with this one. Um, in a current project, the current consideration is to lower the current keep alive from two, 240 seconds to 960 seconds. I'm not sure if that, those numbers might be reversed in order to save energy of the device as the developer says that the ping every four minutes is too expensive. I currently don't see the disadvantage of this. Do I overlook something? The specification says the actual value of the keep alive is 
application specific. Typically, this is in few, a few minutes. The maximum value is 18 hours, 12 minutes, 15 seconds. So I guess the kind of the, the question is kind of how important is keep alive versus um, energy management? So yeah, this this this, this, is a, this is a very good question, and this this, this tells me that whoever is um, designing this application, they really thought about it. Because yes, in, in many uh, situations, energy consumption really is key, especially when you want to utilize the always on connectivity that MQTT provides. So increasing the keep alive to a high value here typically would save you energy. There is a caveat or there is a catch though. And this is that um, in, in real life, right? Network connections, they aren't as simple as here's my application, here's my broker, I'm connected and I'm simply sending a ping every 10 minutes or whatever, or it says uh, 16 minutes, I think you said, right? 960. But um, the reality is that you have multiple infrastructure components in between the broker, uh, the, the, the client and the broker. And there's a high likelihood that, that some of these uh, components have their own timeouts. So they, they, for, for example, you could have, um, when you're using an I, IoT SIM card, for example, you would, you would start on the public network of the internet service provider that you're using. And from there, via what is called a netting firewall, you would get assigned a public IP address that you could then use to connect to the broker hosted in the public internet. These netting firewalls typically rewrite rules if there is no traffic for three minutes. Similarly, some load balancers, some uh, routers, there's there's just a, a, there's a there's a high chance that on the way to the broker, you come across a, a device that might have um, a lower timeout period than your keep alive uh, period. So this is what you need to consider. Um, how you solve this is depending on what your situation is, you might even have a, a clear insight here into the networking. Otherwise, um, I would recommend just testing till you get to the highest value and this way um, you can get to the, to the best and highest uh, value there. So this question came from Helena Wang. Did, did that answer your question? Um, hi, Florian. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, actually, yeah. I just thought I uh, used this very nice um, occasion and ask you this question, although it's, yeah, not so much uh, appropriate um, with your current session. Yes, it uh, answered my question. And yes, it was very helpful. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, um, so Kusa, we've got another Industry 4.0 question. Um, so I'll ask you to take this one. In the case of a PLC in Industry 4.0, we create JSON messages that encapsulate all the tags on the PLC. Is there another way to, 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 to do this? Okay, uh, so is it um, maybe just to 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 uh, confirm there is it, is it pure MQTT or or is it using a, a Spark plug? Okay, so, yeah, so, because so, so why don't you explain the differences to, okay. to, to the to the audience, right? So all right, so yeah, so with the with the pure MQTT, you you, you know, the, the best way really is is for you to to use a, a JSON payload. I think that's actually the the. Uh, the best way to do it because at least then from the other end you'll be able to 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 to, to be easier to corral uh, your 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 tags uh, from the JSON uh, payload because at least you'll be able to identify them using their uh, key value uh, uh, pairs, right? So I, well, I can think of uh, any other way of doing it uh, on 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 the PLC side if you're using the uh, the PMKTT. So and then if uh, now this is where the the issue of spark plug uh, really comes into into play that's the importance of, of spark plug because it it allows you to use the uh, standardized um, uh, uh, data format right so if you if the values that you are, you are reading from a plc is a is a float value the moment that you actually assign it as such coming from the plc you are guaranteed that uh, whatever device is on the receiving end will be able to decode that information without having to be hard coded to understand that this is uh, a floating uh, number, a floating point number that it is expecting to receive, or if it is a, a, an integer that is it is expecting to receive. So also with the uh, Spark plug uh, payload, if you're going to use an MQTT Spark plug payload, it allows you to extend those uh, 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 
that, that payload definition to actually include your own data model. So if you're gonna be using a data model that is uh, it's understandable within your own organization. So if it's a PLC, uh, suppose you are, you are uh, transmitting this information across from factory A to factory B. So it allows you to extend a, a model that you, you, you'll be able to identify from within your uh, uh, infrastructure. So I would say, yeah, with the PMQTT, you could go the route of using a, a JSON to encode that information. But uh, preferably in that in an in a industrial set setup, you'd want to actually use a Spark plug because it takes care of all of that for you. Great. Well, th thank you um, for that. Um, we're we're going to move on and we're kind of going to go, go kind of a bit quicker here. So to, to get through some of these questions, um, how do I migrate if I'm using a different message broker from IBM, IBM MQ? Dominic, do you want, do you want to handle that one? Um, yeah, absolutely. So there are basically there are, there are two paths here. Um, first path is you're already using MQDT and, for example, IBM MQ, and you're using the MQDT capabilities of that. If this is your, if this is your case, awesome, because you bet on an open standard like MQDT, which allows you to migrate extremely easy. And we have um, yeah some some recent let's say customer stories who did exactly that, which was awesome um, for them because it's pretty simple to go to a cloud native IoT messaging solution like HiveMQ without changing the devices at all um, or the applications. So if you are using, let's say, JMS or some other kind of proprietary, um, let's say, binary protocol of that broker, you usually have this kind of migration project um, because you need to change your applications. The good thing is um, this will absolutely simplify your applications. So usually this kind of of let's say rewrites are done pretty quickly, um, if it makes sense. There are some use cases where let's say um, we wouldn't recommend to do that. Some of them, especially for let's say pure enterprise messaging needs, um, you, and you have a very specific use case. But as soon as you have device communication or application to device communication, absolutely, um, it will. It's it's pretty simple, but this is something we help a lot of customers uh, basically doing that kind of migration projects. So I would suggest for the use case to reach out, um, and we can happily discuss if it even makes sense. Because sometimes it doesn't make a lot of sense at all. Um, then we would also tell you uh, because, but in a lot of cases it makes a lot of sense, and you save a lot of money down the line. So this would be something I would ask you to just reach out, and we can discuss the use case. And we'll put contact information at the end of the webinar to 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 be able to contact us if, if you want to follow up. Um, uh, actually, another uh, a SCADA question for for Kutside. for integrating broker to SCADA software. If the SCADA software doesn't support MQ protocol, is there any solution for integrating the broker to SCADA by OPC UA protocol? So can you come again? Yeah. So for integrating broker MQ broker to a SCADA software. If the SCADA software doesn't support MQ protocol, is there any solution for integrating the broker to sc the SCADA system via OPC UA protocol? Okay, all right. So yeah, I, I guess that will be, um, we'll need some more details to that, but uh, generally, uh, 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 if I understood the question well, so if you've got a, an OPC UA, uh, uh, OPC or OPC, uh, a SCADA system is a downstream device. Now you want to integrate it to like an MQTT network. So under that situation, you, for example, use uh, an OPC publisher. So there's some modules uh, that you could use uh, that will convert uh, from uh, MQTT uh, on one side. It actually reads OPC on one side and then publishes it as an, uh, an, as an MQTT uh, message to the broker. So you are sort of like putting a, 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 a gateway. So you're using a, a bridge so they, they obviously isn't a way of directly integrating it. If it doesn't talk MQTT, you're gonna need some sort of gateway. So it could be like a, a hardware piece of hardware that is a, a compatible as an, as an MQTT edge of network node if it's spark plug, or it could be a piece of software that you could run uh, on, your, on, on a local network that is reading all of that uh, OPC information and then publishing it uh, to uh, that MQTT broker. Yeah, so, so someone put it in the chat, um, Kepware has, has the capability of going from OPC UA to, to MQTT in, in their gateway. So for, for as an example, and I know inductive automation can, can do that too, as, as an example too. So, um, yeah. um, 
so so Dominic, I think this one's for for you. Is there any difference in the sense of reliability and scalability between the, the MQ versions, or is it related to the broker? So, um, in general, uh, if you're using a professional MQT broker, I would not expect anything here um, in terms of scalability. So, um, so I can basically for hive MQ related things, um, there's really no scalability thing here. Um, there are some things on the client side which make it easier though. On the broker side, basically this is something we got you covered. And you can even have MQTT3 and MQTT5 at the same time. Um, if you talk about it's a scalability on the device side, it's not scalability, but you can also utilize MQTT5 features, which allow you to save a lot of bandwidth. For example, topic aliases um, and other features. So, and by the way, when talking about MQTT5, this is also something I get asked a lot. Should I use MQTT version three or five? Um, it's extremely simple. Use MQTT version five. Um, let's say anybody like in 2021 who tells you you should not use MQTT5 basically didn't do their homework for a very long time. MQTT version five was generally available 2018. And MQT version three is basically uh, was specified 2014 and is basically old since 1999. So this is basically like use MQT version five. Everything else for today's deployments is something that doesn't make a lot of sense at all. Um, ju just as a as a let's say opinion here, because a lot of the things you want to you see downstream uh, when implementing a project is if you use version <laughs> three, you say you say man, I really wish I could do that and that and that. And MQT5 exactly allows you to do that. So please use MQT version five. Anything else is just a limitation um, if you buy probably broker vendors or, or uh, cloud vendors or so on, because version five is 2018. This is still old, like three years, even in IT is pretty old. Um, so you should definitely go for that. Okay. And uh, another one for you, um, probably Dominic. Um, what's the best way to connect MQTT to Kafka that preserves a good performance and simple implementation? Yeah. Um, so uh, this, is a, this is a good topic. We actually, we have also some blog posts here. You can uh, Google this up if you want more details because I want to be quick here. Um, what we believe is the best way, and this is what our customers are doing with literally hundreds of thousands of messages flowing into both directions all the time um, as a per second is uh, using a, a pure play MQTT broker, which can connect millions of devices, can handle tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of messages per second, and then integrate over the native Kafka protocol directly to Kafka in a bi-directional way. So you can make sure a message never gets lost. So we have the uh, Kafka enterprise extension for doing exactly that. So our customers basically plug in the extension configure the topics and in, a, in half an hour, they're good to go in a, with a production ready system that is hardened and can work in a high available case. Please don't build any custom bridges like an application that reads MQT messages, converts it to Kafka. You will lose messages along the way. So, so the best way really is uh, to have the broker directly speak the Kafka protocol um, and in a bi-directional way. And yeah, this is also something I would say a very large, percentage of our customers are doing in production, um, like in a rock solid way. Okay, um, so quick one maybe for Florian here. When an MQT message can't be delivered to the destination, does the broker keep the message and for, and for how long? That is indeed a, a good question. Of course, it, it depends on, on, on various factors, such as which quality of service level is used, is the destination client using a clean session or not, but let's assume um, you want the broker to um, store the message for the, for the client in case the client is, is disconnected, then you use a, um, you do not use a clean session and you use quality of service one or two. And in that case, um, the, the message will be queued on the broker basically indefinitely by default with MQTT five, um, you can also specify message expiry or ses session expiry intervals if you do not want an indefinite um, persistence of that message. Okay, perfect. Um, and this is probably going to be our last last question. Um, and Dominic, I think you're probably going to be best to, to answer this. So we provided 3D digital twins 
of industrial and engineering and would like to integrate MQ data into our 3D immersive solutions. How easy can this be done? Um, very easy. <laughs> um, because um, you really just need an MQDT client. So I'm not sure what this application is programmed in. I assume something like C++ or something like Java. So what you, you, you would be doing is you would be, um, let's say, going for an open source MQDT library. If it's Java, you could go for the um, HyperQ MQDT client. If it's um, um, C or C++ or something else, go to the Eclipse Paho project, um, which, which also we have to support. And um, yeah, use an MQDT client and like a first, let's say proof of concept is usually a few lines of code. And so you can send data, but also consume data in a bi-directional way. Um, so it should be extremely simple actually to do. So, so Bez, um, you, you're our last question. So I'll let you ask a follow-up here if, if you have uh, uh, any follow-up questions here. Yes, thanks for that. Um, well, the thing is, um, it's about uh, um, how we actually integrate this and into the, in order to actually get the live data streams. Mm -hmm. And I think probably this is this may not be as simple because um, the way that we do it, for instance, uh, we have a, a factory floor and we have got our IoT devices scattered around the factories, obviously um, producing uh, data. But mm -hmm. what normally happens in, in normal world, um, a, somebody has to go to the machine with a reader in order to actually to obtain the data. Mm -hmm. But what we are doing or aiming to do is create a 3D digital twin of the actual, the, okay, it could be a factory, it could be engineering side, it could be an oil and gas industry somewhere. But rather than actually somebody to go physically to, this, to the um, site, we actually bring them into the digital twin of the space. So oh, yeah. they can literally move inside the 3D digital twin and get into the, uh, where the location of that uh, specific machinery is in order to actually to read data. But yeah. we have a pointer or a tag where you click on the tag, that yeah. tag actually streams um, live data. Yeah. So, okay, so, so thank you so much for your context. Um, it make, makes a lot of sense. So I would say just from what I heard, I mean, you're right, it's not that simple then because you don't, because actually we also talking about interoperability here. It's not just about, let's say the, the um, let's say raw transport layer, what MQT provides is also basically about the, um, layers above um so we are a bit over time but but I, we can we're happy to have follow-up conversations here um i think spark plug might solve mqdt spark plug might solve a lot of the let's say challenges from what you're saying here um because a lot of the things um might really help here um for let's say the live data streams this is something um it needs to be discussed separately um but this is also possible because mqdt spark plug also allows for this kind of uh, let's say remote controls um, and the awesome thing is you get interoperability so if you haven't checked it out mqdt spark plug might really be something you might be looking for yeah thank you for that i think um this would be something that definitely we do need to obviously to um exchange possibly via an email and uh, um, have a further discussion yeah happy to thank you so much for your question thank you very much well, and, and thank you very much, very much for, to, to everyone. Um, I'm sorry we did not get through um, everyone's questions. What we'll do is we'll try and follow up on our community forums um, with answering them there um, so everyone can see see the answers to, to, to your questions. Um, and because we often find people have the same similar questions, so we want to kind of share, share the answers with everyone. Um, but thank you. Um, this has always been a very popular format, so I'm, I'm sure we'll, we'll do it again um, at, at a kind of a future date. So thank you, everyone. Take care. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank Bye. you, everyone. Thank you. See you next time. Bye. Ciao.